Hello, I'm Philip Cohen. Today we're going to talk about where we are overall with the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. Let's get into it. Uh, for our overview, I'm going to talk about the little bit of history and sort of the terms that we're using, um, the global situation briefly, where the United States fits into that, our particular kind of failure in this uh, pandemic, and then the crises that this has generated, a few different crises that are obviously all overlapping, and then some comments on the future. A pandemic. A pandemic comes from Greek, pan and demos, it's all people. Um, uh, we use it in modern times to mean the worldwide spread of a new disease. Um, this particular pandemic um, was declared by the World Health Organization, the authority for things like this, um, on March 11th of this year, 2020. Um, the way to think about the relationship between a pandemic and an epidemic, an epidemic is the spread of disease. Um, uh, our epidemic here in the United States is part of the global pandemic. So we're living in a pandemic, and you can describe the epidemic here and there um, uh, in our situation. There have been a number of pandemics in the past. Here are a few, um, uh, the big ones in the last hundred years, starting with the uh, great so-called Spanish flu, the 1918 influenza pandemic, um, probably did not come from Spain. <clears throat> um, about one third of all people in the world were infected during that pandemic and about 50 million people died, including more than half a million Americans. Remember the world population was a lot smaller back then. Um, that was a very, uh, obviously a very bad pandemic. It spread all the way around the world sort of twice. Um, uh, other flu in, uh, epidemics that became pandemics in 1957 and 1968 killed about 1 million people each, those influenza pandemics. Um, uh, one of those um, viruses is still sort of running around now, um, uh, but not as bad as it used to be. Um, the, we had the precursor to today's coronavirus uh, pandemic was in 2003, the SARS uh, pandemic, which only killed about 800 people. Um, but, um, but spread very virulently and was um, extremely scary before it was controlled. The much larger uh, swine flu, so-called swine flu or H1N1 uh, pandemic in 2009, um, which killed about 200,000 people, um, uh, not, not as many as we are seeing die this time. Um, we are already up to um, uh, uh, almost a million people uh, died and uh, you'll see millions and millions of cases around the world. That's a little bit of context for uh, this pandemic in light of previous ones. Um, we call it coronavirus. Um, th there are a number of coronavirus diseases that affect humans and other species. This one is the novel coronavirus 2019 because it came, it was discovered in 2019. Um, we are pretty sure it came from a bat um, to a person, possibly through some other species. So somebody ate a bat or a bat bit somebody and then um, uh, transferred from that animal to people um, in or near Wuhan, China um, late last year. So the virus SARS-CoV-2 causes the coronavirus disease, COVID-19. So we can call it coronavirus, we can call it COVID-19, which is the disease and the virus is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, okay. Um, why is COVID-19 so bad? Why is this epidemic so bad? Well, because it's a novel um, disease, that means we are not immune to it. So um, as far as we know, nobody was immune to it when this started. Uh, and it's very highly contagious. So it spreads very easily between people um, and uh, all they have to do is interact or be close to each other. Um, if there's no, not taking any precautions and the virus transmits and nobody is immune. Um, to make matters worse, it transmits asymptomatically. That is, there are people who show no signs um, that they are sick who can transmit it. So it's hard to uh, avoid people who are transmitting the disease. Um, it transmits through aerosols, which are tiny airborne particles you can get just from breathing. So you don't have to spit or cough or sneeze on somebody to transmit the virus. Um, and on top of all that, it has relatively high mortality. Our seasonal flu infection fatality rate, that is all the people who have the infection, out of every thousand of them, less than one dies, somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7, normally die from uh, the seasonal flu. Um, and the COVID-19 infection fatality rate is probably about 10 times that. We're not exactly sure, but something like six to 10 people uh, out of every thousand who get the infection um, seem to die. So that's a much higher fatality rate 
um, than flu. And of course, in addition to all the people who die, many other people are uh, seriously ill or suffer um, other health consequences from getting the virus. To show where we are in the world pandemic right now, here are the cases and the deaths. Notice the scale on these two figures is different. So we're up, uh, uh, the world overall is over 20 million cases, approaching 25 million now in late August. Um, these are cases that are diagnosed or so-called confirmed cases. Um, we think a lot more people have been infected with the disease, but we don't have a count of them. I show the United States on here for comparison. The United States is over 5 million cases um, out of the world's 20 something million um, and, uh, and rising. So um, we're taking up a big share of the world uh, pandemic here. In terms of deaths, the world has uh, something over 80,000 confirmed deaths from the virus. Uh, the United States approaching 200,000 of those. So um, approaching a quarter of the global deaths have occurred in this country. So let's put that in context. Here's the world distribution of cases. Uh, you can see it has spread around the world, started in China, um, spread to Europe, spread to the United States. The US now has the most confirmed cases of any country, 5.5 or so million. You see the other biggest countries in terms of raw numbers are India approaching 3 million, Brazil with more than 3 million. Of course, those are countries with big populations, especially India. Uh, you, uh, you can see um, a million or so spread around Europe and uh, Russia approaching a million, uh, half a million cases in South Africa, uh, most of the rest of Africa, not that many cases yet, um, still spreading there and hopefully not, not as bad because of precautions taken. So it's, uh, it's global around the world and the big countries you can see, US, India, Brazil, Russia, and some places in Europe. Uh, just looking at high income countries to sort of see how the United States compares with its peers, sort of other, these are countries with at least $30,000 a year annual income and 5 million population. So what we call high income, high income countries um, and not that small. Um, the United States in this group has more cases for every thousand uh, people in our country than any other country by quite a bit. Israel is next and Singapore. We're up around uh, 17 cases out of every thousand, 17 cases for every thousand people in our country. You can see if you get down to Poland, Denmark, Germany, and so on, it's, it's uh, several times less than that. In terms of deaths per million in our population, um, there are uh, uh, five large rich countries with higher death rates than we've had, Sweden, Italy, Spain, United Kingdom, and Belgium. Um, uh, and that's on a population basis. Um, and then all the other rich countries had fewer deaths per person than we did. But this is a little bit misleading because it doesn't show the trajectory of what's happening now. That's what we really have to understand. So here I show the United States in the red line and all the other rich countries um, in the black line. Uh, and then some of the specific, the larger ones um, shown in little faint gray lines so you can see what's happening. Look at the figure on the left side first. This is the daily deaths. Um, you can see that in late April, when we had our peak, there were those five countries with higher peaks than us, uh, including much higher, like, like uh, Italy and uh, Spain, many, many more deaths at that time per person in their populations. We all started to decline after that, but the key thing is that those countries had a faster decline um, and a more continuous decline. So by June, our, death, uh, our daily deaths had stopped declining by the end of June and actually started rising again in July and August, um, which is virtually unique in the rich countries. Um, and, and now we're at about 10 times or more um, deaths per day um, uh, relative to our population than the other rich countries um, of the world. Uh, the figure on the right shows you the um, deaths per million population if you add them all up. So we're up over 500 deaths out of every million Americans. Um, the other rich countries uh, of the world uh, down around 200 per million. So um, the U.S. has high rates, but more importantly for now, the U.S. Um, has not had um, that um, uh, steep drop in rates down to a manageable level uh, of the pandemic. So we still have um, something of a raging epidemic uh, compared to these other countries. As you probably know, the impact of this uh, epidemic has not been equally shared across the country. There's very big geographic concentration, for example, New York and uh, Detroit and New Orleans and Houston, the places that became, that had lots and lots of cases. Um, but 
uh, overall, as it is spread around the country, we have seen a very big disparity by race and ethnicity. Um, uh, black Americans have had the highest death rates, um, 85 per 100,000 people. Um, uh, whites, uh, Asians, and Pacific Islanders had the lowest, with Hispanics and American Indians in between. Um, we can talk all about the um, long run and short run causes for this, the discrimination that um, leads to uh, the other things, the uh, inequitable access to health care and good health care, uh, working in occupations that involve um, frontline or essential services where um, uh, people are interacting with uh, members of the public uh, at work, um, uh, inequalities in income and education and wealth, sort of the resource that people have to deal with or prevent um, a disease like this, and then housing, quality, and quantity, so the, the how crowded and where people live and so on. So all of that together, coming together to produce very big uh, disparities by race and ethnicity. Now let's look at more specifically what went wrong in the United States. I'll talk about a few things that Trump did, uh, President Trump. Um, uh, before all this happened, uh, he was already cutting funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You can see it was uh, uh, up around over seven and a half billion dollars per year. Uh, two years ago and already cut down by about a billion for the 2020 budget. Um, so we're already, we're cutting down our investment in public health infrastructure, which was not a good idea, as we now know. Um, more specifically, uh, President Trump canceled, uh, closed down the uh, a pandemic office operated by the National Security Council, um, uh, which was supposed to uh, stay on top of and coordinate responses to global um, disease outbreaks. Um, uh, uh, when that happened, uh, there was a very clear message from the Center for Strategic and International Studies here, but many others also. Um, it's unclear who would be in charge at the White House with the NSC not doing this in the case of a pandemic. Um, and that turned to, out to be um, true. Uh, Trump specifically ignored warnings very close to him, um, despite claiming uh, falsely in March that nobody knew there would be a pandemic of this proportion, nobody's ever seen anything like this before, which, as I just showed you, totally not true. Um, in fact, in his own administration, they were running a functional exercise scenario. They were, they were gaming out um, what would happen in the case of a global pandemic um, that came from China. Um, and uh, uh, it had all kinds of uh, good information and recommendations that were all ignored. Uh, there were uh, uh, warnings broadcast out through the popular media also. Here's an article by journalist Ed Young in 2018. The next plague is coming. Is America ready? Um, the U.S. is disturbingly vulnerable, in some respects becoming quickly more so. Public health programs are low on money. Hospitals are stretched perilously thin. Crucial funding is being slashed. That's 2018. Uh, uh, even uh, uh, Joe Biden, running for president last fall, said we are not prepared for a pandemic. Trump has rolled back progress Obama and I made to strengthen global health security. Um, this was not that much of a surprise. The details are always a surprise, but the fact that this was inevitable at some point and that we were not prepared was known. In addition to those programmatic failures and um, bad budget decisions, um, when the uh, pandemic began and as it spread, um, the president was more uh, concerned with how it made him look than he was with actually dealing with the epidemic. Um, so he said over and over again that things were going fine. They were not going fine. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China and we have it under control. It's uh, gonna be just fine. And we think we have it very well under control. Uh, we have very little problem in this country at this moment, five. And those people are all recuperating successfully. But we're working very closely with China and other countries, and we think it's going to have a very good ending for us. So uh, that I can uh, assure you. Now, the virus that we're talking about having to do, you know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat, as the heat comes in. Uh, typically, that will go away in April. We're in great shape, though. We're, we have 12 cases, 11 cases, and uh, many of them are in good shape now. We have it very much under control in this country. And again, when you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, 
That's a pretty good job we've done. It's going to disappear one day. It's like a miracle. It will disappear. And we're prepared and we're doing a great job with it. And it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. It was obvious at the time that that was all wrong um, and self-serving on his part. Um, so let's look at uh, uh, these failures. Um, how, how, let's look at how the failures compounded as the epidemic uh, rolled out across the country. Um, from the very beginning, we did not have enough testing. So we did not know who had the virus and who didn't. That meant we couldn't do contact tracing, which is when you find out someone has the disease and you immediately find out who they've been with and you make all those people stay home um, so they don't spread it. We, you can only do that if you know who has it. We didn't have enough testing from the very beginning. Uh, partly for that reason, we essentially did not contain it. It spread. We didn't do anything to stop travel um, within the country. So there was nothing to stop people from leaving New York and going to New Orleans for Mardi Gras um, and bringing the virus with them, for example. Um, uh, and uh, the numbers got too big. The testing and tracing only works if you, if you have low numbers. Um, once we realized, we meaning the federal government caught up with everybody else and admitted it was a very serious problem, um, the uh, policy uh, efforts at, the, at that point were slow and weak. In other words, we never had a very strong lockdown. We never closed everything. We never uh, stopped travel within the country uh, and so on. Um, when uh, the cases were exploding and, uh, case and hospitalizations and deaths were um, out of control, especially in the, the New York area, there was gross mismanagement of the vital equipment and supplies and uh, professionals needed um, just to handle it. And so more people died than, than should have died even once they already had the virus. We had um, a whole category of outbreaks in uh, institutional settings, in nursing homes, in prisons, and factories um, that were largely unchecked, especially at the beginning. Um, and then those became uh, epicenters that, from which the disease spread out into their local communities. Um, and the communities where nursing homes and prisons and the meat plants especially are um, uh, 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 largely low-income and minority communities. Um, and repeatedly, like you saw from the Trump clips, but, uh, but much more than just that, um, a mix of happy talk, mixed messages on the advice we were getting, um, a general attitude, a cynical or negative attitude about science and expertise coming from the top, um, a lot of conspiracy theories I'll talk a little bit about, and then this sort of um, useless kind of hero talk, oh, we're warriors, we're tough, we're strong. Um, that's not how you fight a virus, basically. You fight a virus by acting weak and staying home, um, and we didn't do that. So I'm gonna give a, um, a, just one little case study to show uh, how another country dealt with their um, worse epidemic um, and ended up with a better outcome, uh, a better, in a better place now than the United States is. And this is Italy. And you can see Italy had a huge spike in deaths um, and this is um, per million population. So it's, uh, or holding the population size constant between these two countries. Um, a, a huge spike in deaths uh, in March, about a month before ours, um, a steeper and greater rise in Italy. Italy, one of the first countries to have a serious outbreak. Um, it spread all around before we knew what was happening, sort of. Um, and uh, they were just figuring out what to do as they went. But then uh, you can see the very um, steep decline they had ended up much steeper than ours, and now we have more than 10 times the deaths um, ongoing than they do. They're, um, they're getting ready to go back to school. Here I put some lines that show what happened in Italy um, and how they did it, just to give us a sense of the things that we didn't do that help explain why we have so many more cases and deaths at, still at this point um, than Italy does. So you see the very first red line there, the first two deaths discovered at the beginning of February. And the first thing they did was lock down a few towns in the north they, with, with uh, checkpoints and barricades and they brought to just contain it. It didn't work, it was too late. Um, the virus had already spread out from those um, few towns. And so by early March, they closed down the whole northern region of the country um, uh, and tried to contain it there. And again, they restricted movements, they had police and checkpoints and um, tried to contain it in that part of the country. Um, uh, within a week or so of that, they closed all schools and all sporting events around the country. Um, uh, and uh, shortly after that, they realized it wasn't enough. They already had cases around the country and they went into a national lockdown uh, around the second week of March. Um, their lockdown was much stronger than anything we had. 
in this country and that you could not leave the house uh, unless you were going to uh, the doctor to get necessary supplies or to go do an essential job. And the police would stop you and you had to explain what you were doing. We had nothing like that um, in this country. You could not travel between regions of the country um, uh, by and large. You couldn't go from one city to another or one state in the country to another. We never had that restriction in this country. Um, and by the time they did this complete economic shutdown um, uh, in, uh, in early March, they shut down all workplaces that were not essential workplaces. Factories were closed. Um, anything that was not an essential workplace um, was shut down. You can see they did that for uh, about five or six weeks, and then they were able to start reopening. Um, the, the deaths were falling, but deaths that we count reflect cases a few weeks earlier. So as they were seeing the great decline in deaths, um, the cases were already falling faster than that. They were able to do some partial reopening. They allowed people to travel within their home states. Um, they opened up some factories to get the economy going. Uh, uh, a few weeks after that, they had further reopening. They allowed most businesses to open with social distancing. Uh, by now, they're wearing masks. They allowed travel only within regions, but still not letting people move all the way around the country. Then. By the third week in May, they're opening pools and gyms and other sort of businesses that involve more close physical interaction. And all the way uh, uh, out to June, June 15th, they're opening theaters um, and, uh, and they're uh, pretty close to back to normal with distancing, with masks. Um, and now they have a low enough number of cases that they can do testing and tracing, isolate people who get infected and manage, contain. Uh, the epidemic. We never reached that level of containment in this country. So um, we never had that level of closure. Um, and now we never had a small enough number of cases that we could jump on them, isolate them, and stop outbreaks as they occur. So our epidemic uh, is relatively uncontrolled still at this point. It's only controlled to the extent um, that people are wearing masks and staying home as much as possible. Um, so that just shows a successful case and an unsuccessful case and sort of what it would have taken uh, for us to do what Italy did. So why did we fail so badly? Um, a number of reasons. I mentioned um, the bad decisions that Trump made, um, but we have some, uh, some things that followed from that or related to that, including this very partisan attitude toward the science of the pandemic. Um, these are four questions that have correct answers. Um, and uh, Republicans get the answers wrong much more than Democrats do because they believe what their political leaders tell them instead of um, science and the facts. And that's a, that's a defect in our culture um, that, that, um, that that happens. For example, social distancing measures are helping a lot to slow the spread of the virus, the first question. That is 100% true. Um, liberal Democrats, 76% agree with it, um, only 47% of conservative Republicans. Um, the coronavirus spreads more easily than other infectious diseases, absolutely. There are some that, are, that spread more easily, like measles, but most do not. Um, Democrats know that much more, 78%, than Republicans, 58%. There's not enough testing. Uh, this is uncontrovertibly true. This is just a true fact. 82% of liberal Democrats know that, 31% of Republicans. Um, so uh, science can answer these questions, but because of the way our politics corrupts our science or our science um, fails to penetrate into our political bubbles, um, we are uh, impaired from being able to do smart things. Worse than failure to um, be educated are the efforts to miseducate or diseducate, um, spread misinformation and disinformation. Um, we have raging conspiracy theories in this country, which are partly related to politics uh, and partly not. One, the so-called pandemic is the idea that the whole thing is on purpose uh, for profit, for profiteering and so on, um, totally not true. Um, uh, there's the idea that the virus is spread or enabled somehow by the 5G cell phone network, also completely not true. Um, there's the idea that masks are bad for your health, there's some kind of plot to weaken us, um, also completely not true. And then there are the fake um, cures uh, and treatments, uh, many of them spread um, by uh, important people, including the president. He retweeted this about hydroxychloroquine, I'm saying it should be over the counter, it would solve everything. It just is not true. Um, so um, there's uh, so much disinformation in our public square that is very hard for um, people who are not full-time um, uh, debunkers to figure out what the true story is. On top of this, um, uh, we have racism and xenophobia um, uh, affecting how we uh, react to the pandemic. 
Um, uh, a lot of white people think it is a disease of non-white people. Um, uh, uh, just like a lot of people in Texas or Arizona thought it was a problem in New York. Um, the president himself has uh, spread a lot of anti-Asian racism, referring to the ugly face of the virus and uh, blaming China, calling it the China virus. Um, there have been vandalism against uh, Asian businesses, random attacks on Asian people. You see the Asian face on the pinata in a restaurant in St. Louis, and these um, sentiments from the president. It's got all different names. Wuhan. Got Wuhan was catching on. Coronavirus, right? Kung flu, yeah. Kung flu. Uh, you can see the crowd, hear the crowd cheering on, um, uh, egging him on to say the racist um, smear. Uh, then when it comes to our southern border, the president has also maintained um, that border control is key to stopping uh, the virus of the spreading. Um, at this point, um, uh, probably a better, it's better for Mexicans than for Americans to have the border closed, um, but he has continued to press this message as well. Using our emergency public health authorities, we prevented a coronavirus catastrophe on the southern border, shutting down human smuggling and swiftly returning the crosses. We call them crosses. They cross, now we bring them right back. In the old days, it would take years to get them back. You wouldn't get them back. Without these public health measures, the southern border would be a global epicenter of the viral transmission. Yes, well, the southern border is a global epicenter of virus transmission on our side of the border. Um, and the Rio Grande Valley in particular has been um, extremely hard hit uh, in Texas. Okay, so let's talk about the crises that have followed from the disease epidemic. Um, probably most prominently, the economic crisis. Um, this is the number of people employed, not counting farmers, the number of people employed from 2000 to the present, so over those 20 years. You can see it was about 130 million, those are thousands, so it's about 130 million people employed in the early 2000s, rising, rising, rising to what we used to call the Great Recession, 2008, a big drop, Obama took office and had to dig out of that hole. You can see the rising, rising, rising number of employed people, of course the population growing too, um, up to over 150 million employed people by the time Trump is in his third year. And then uh, April of this year comes and it just collapses. 20 million fewer people employed suddenly in one month. Um, uh, uh, it may in some ways worse than that because some people had to change jobs and so on so they count as employed, but they're not in the job they were in before. Um, we've chipped back um, a little bit of that, um, uh, but um, the economic crisis has been extremely severe um, and tens of millions of people have been uh, extremely hard hit by that. You can juxtapose the food lines in Queens, New York now versus lines in New York City um, during the Great Depression, uh, 1931. Um, people are lining up for free food. They have no money, they have no jobs. We have a crisis in education um, that comes from having shut down schools, which was the right thing to do from a public health point of view, but still caused massive educational disruption, which will widen inequality. You look at the first figure here, this is from a company that tracks online math uh, participation by students. Um, you can see in the higher income zip codes, uh, math participation online dropped about 20% right away in March, but it was dropped over 60% in low income zip codes. And then the richer zip codes bounced back, got everybody online and back to work um, by May, but the poor zip codes never did. Um, uh, the second figure shows some estimates of how many months of learning we're going to lose um, if we don't have in-class instruction this fall, which um, we're not going to for a lot of the country. And judging by the estimates of how many people get online, how many people participate, um, they made some educated guesses and estimate that uh, overall we'll lose about seven months of, in, uh, of learning uh, on average, um, but it's more for blacks and Hispanics than for whites and much more for low-income students. That's based on the participation rates that that we're seeing now. So um, uh, an extreme education crisis uh, and one that is widening inequalities. On the other hand, reopening schools um, carries great risks, which are also unequally uh, distributed. Um, uh, as schools have reopened, we've seen um, viral outbreaks um, in colleges also, but I'm thinking here about um, K through 12 schools. 
Um, and so we have to face the decision of keeping schools closed and harming the education of children versus keeping schools open and having the, the uh, virus spread uncontrolled. Um, the little bar chart up there shows um, the much higher, um, five to eight times higher hospitalization rates um, for black and Hispanic versus white children, um, just much more likely um, uh, to get coronavirus and get very sick from it than white children. Um, the figure below shows the um, percentage of seniors who live with a child. Um, so if we open schools, this is who we're putting at risk. And you can see only 4% of white seniors live in a household uh, with a school-aged child compared with 11% of black seniors and 13 to 19% of people in other groups. So if we open schools, we're putting these older people at greater risk. Um, uh, and that's not equally distributed. So there's no good choices. The epidemic has produced a family crisis um, uh, uh, in a number of dimensions. One is violence and abuse um, without adequate intervention. We don't have great data on this because um, the way we collect data on this is from people leaving their houses and doing things like going to work and going to school and going to the doctor. And a lot of that has not been happening. So for example, one study found that there were fewer um, visits to the emergency room with um, a sort of injuries related to domestic violence, but the injuries there were showing up were more serious. So um, it looks like a lot of people are getting, um, are getting injured or, or having abuse happen in their homes but are not making it to the emergency room unless their injuries are very serious. So this is a bad problem. We don't know exactly how bad yet. Um, in terms of families also, we have an unequal gender impact of the shutdowns that we experienced. So that um, uh, as the figure shows, the group with the most likely to drop out of the labor force from February to April in that key period uh, were women with children and school ages. Um, so um, we have women dropping out of their jobs more than men, uh, uh, doing more of the childcare and housework at home, although there's also evidence of men sharing, um, sharing in that, those burdens um, when they are home. So it's gonna be interesting how that sorts out. Um, and the care work burdens themselves, um, taking care of children, taking care of elders without a lot of the supports um, that we have in normal times um, have made things really hard for a lot of people and a lot of families. So that's something we really have to watch. Um, on top of this, an extreme mental health crisis, and this is very extreme. Um, the stress uh, of fear um, from the pandemic itself, but also the isolation from being alone or living alone, being separated from friends and loved ones, um, the despair simply at all the bad news and, all, and the likelihood that bad news will continue, um, and also being separated from services, whether medical or counseling or other services that people need um, to keep their lives in order. Um, this has produced um, a lot of depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation, that is thinking about suicide. Just wanna pause to say here, um, uh, if you are anxious and depressed, if you are thinking about suicide, um, um, you are obviously not alone. A lot of people are, a lot of people are not talking about it. Um, there are the numbers there um, for you to call um, and seek help at any time. Um, and you should not feel like uh, you're the only one or you are burdening anybody by asking for that help, so please do. Um, I was astounded by this um, figure uh, put together um, on the percentage of young adults who were seriously considering suicide in the past 12 months. Um, before this year, we would have been pretty troubled. We were pretty troubled by the rise from about 7% in 2010 up to 11% of young adults seriously considering suicide in a given year um, up to 2018. And now in a survey taken in June 2020, 26% of adults under age 25. Um, reported seriously considering suicide in the last 30 days. Um, so obviously in a very extreme time, and we know a lot of people are really hurting right now. So something we really have to um, uh, try to address. So where are we gonna go here? Um, what's gonna happen next? Well, here's a kind of a worst case scenario, one way to think about it. Um, we've had about 177,000 deaths as of today out of 5.7 million cases. Um, so our case fatality rate, that is the number of people who died for every case we had, um, is uh, about 3%. <clears throat> so about 31 out of every 1,000 people that we know got it have died. However, um, we think that maybe as many as um, 10 times as many people have had it than we think. Maybe 50, 50 million cases already. Um, and maybe our infection fatality rate, as opposed to the case fatality rate, is only 3 out of 1,000. Um, <clears> so... Um, that is a lower death rate in a lot more cases. Maybe we've already had 50 million people infected, a lot of them with no symptoms or minor symptoms. So 
if you play that through, um, if we do kind of a worst case scenario with those numbers, if we do nothing to stop it, the virus spreads all around, eventually, and this is pure speculation based on other diseases, it might be that when it gets to about 70% of people, so we've got 330 million, so when a few hundred million people have had this disease, maybe we would approach what they call herd immunity, where the virus is, people are breathing and it's sneezing it out and it's just running into people who are already immune and so the spread rate drops. Um, if that's true, 230 million people end up getting it, that might mean 700,000 deaths. Um, right now we're at less than 200,000 deaths, so as bad as that has been, um, if we don't get this under control, it will essentially um, probably more than triple. Or we figure out how to treat it um, uh, better, which they're obviously working on, or we have a vaccine or multiple vaccines that can either slow or maybe even stop this transmission. So we're somewhere between now um, approaching 200,000 deaths and maybe something like 700,000 deaths. And the question is, can we slow that down as much as possible so that we can get some kind of medical intervention uh, to prevent getting to all those deaths? Um, when will it be over? Well, um, it seems likely there will be waves of outbreaks for months, um, hopefully not years, um, but it's, it's not contained medically. If we're not really shutting down the country, um, uh, it will be spreading around and we will be reacting locally, staying home when as much as we can, or when we find out that there's an outbreak and so on, um, unless we really change what we're doing in terms of the government. We can only do an effective tracing and isolation um, policy when the numbers are down lower. If there's 100,000 people a day or 50,000 people a day getting it, you can't, you can't make all those phone calls and find out who they've been interacting with and send them all home. You can't do that. Um, you need to have the numbers down before that's really effective. Um, regardless of what happens here, we're not going to be traveling around the world much um, for the next months, year, years. We don't know. So the world is narrowing for a lot of people in terms of the travel that they're not doing. Um, we don't know when vaccines or treatments will be ready. Um, they're testing vaccines. If they work, we don't know how well they'll work. We don't know how safe they'll be. Um, unlikely to be affecting us personally very much um, in less than the next 18 months, but that's speculation. Um, the whole question of herd immunity is actually unknown. That's, that was theory, what I said before. Um, we could have, uh, we could, we might not have herd immunity even when we get to 70%. People could maybe start getting infected again. We don't know yet, so that's still up in the air. Um, uh, and then how will the world change? Um, that's a big question. That's something that we wanna think about um, uh, and try to prepare for as much as possible. Um, so where are you in all of this? Um, well, this is my advice. Follow the public health advice, the real public health advice. Don't jump on the bandwagon of every fad or something you hear, um, but follow the solid public health advice um, from especially your state and local governments. Um, your sociology professor uh, uh, is probably a good source also. Um, if you can stay home, stay home. Um, it's boring. Um, uh, people are very frustrated. People are lonely. Um, uh, it may be impossible to really pull it off, but if you have the choice, if you can, it's just better to stay home. Even if you're not infected, you're not dealing with somebody else who's infected, you're just adding people to the mix and the fewer people moving around the better. Take care of yourselves. Um, this is extremely stressful. You have not experienced anything like this before and neither is anybody else alive on earth today. Um, so um, keep an eye on yourself, keep an eye on your friends and neighbors and your relatives um, and try to figure out what you need and what they need and provide it. Um, if you are distressed, sad, upset, anxious, depressed, um, uh, one kind of behavior that uh, may be helpful is to find ways to help people. Um, that can be done online, that can be done with money, that can be done with different kinds of volunteering, political activism, uh, uh, interacting with people, uh, 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 interacting with people who are themselves struggling in different ways. Lots of ways you can help others, which gives you a sense of purpose in your life. So that's very abstract, but it's advice. Um, and then to think about the future, where are we going after this? Um, the world is gonna be very different. Politics will be different, society will be different, science will be different, your career plans and hopes and dreams um, may have to be radically altered. Um, we don't know how it's gonna be, um, but it's a time to think big. Um, uh, we are probably gonna get through this, and when we do, we're gonna have the opportunity to uh, make some changes around here. 
So think about what you might like to see done and start thinking about how you can get there.